Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I am your decoder. Welcome to the show. What happens here if you're new? Well, first of all, welcome again. You're new here. Uh, one of my writers, in this case Katie, has written me a script. I'm going to read it. I've never read it before. This is Teresita Bassa, Ghost Detective. That sounds like a real thing. You're right. It's like, we've mentioned it before. I do another show called Casual Criminalist. And if you had not subscribed to that, go and do your thing. And by your thing, I mean subscribe. It's a podcast. It's also a YouTube show, much like this show. Anyway, you know when the police, they're, they're like, oh no, we've run out of leads. Let's bring in a psychic. You know they are scraping the bottom of the barrel. I think a ghost detective might be the same thing. I have no idea what this is about. So let's just jump into it. We like a bit of the old paranormal shenanigans on this channel, so here's a murder. With a bit of a ghostly twist, as usual, we'll go through the story first and then get into the weird stuff afterwards. Sometimes we manage to decode things, sometimes we don't, but generally, it's a bit of an interesting ride along the way. I mean, I like to hope so. I, I, li I like to hope so. I like to hope to think so. I like, I think, oh, confused myself. What the hell are you talking about? I can't decode that sentence, that's for sure. I like to think so. It really, you know, I usually have a good time shitting all over the ghost detectives of the world. This episode is about Teresita de Basser, a woman who was murdered and whose ghost then came back to bring her killer to justice. Did it? Didn't it? Who knows? But let's get cracking. I'm going to say I know. No, it didn't. Unless her ghost is like some letter that she wrote and then hid it in a bank vault and gave someone the key and was like, unlock this after 10 years or whatever. And it's like, who murdered? I don't know. That's the, but that's not really a ghost, is it? But you could say, like, the ghost came back. You know, the spirit of her, sp her spirit came back would be better. Because spirit can imply, you know, not her actual, like, literal ghostly spirit. But, like, the spirit of justice, you know. People know what I'm talking about. Why can't I use my words properly today? The murder of Teresita Bassa. The first half of this story is pretty horrible and sad, but we need to tell it in order to possibly make sense of the second half. Oh, don't worry, I'm completely desensitized to horror because I do a true crime podcast that I already mentioned, The Casual Criminalist. Eternal podcasting glory. Or it's like, oh my gosh, I just did one the other day and it's like, and then he murdered a nine-year-old. And you're like, oh, for fuck's sake, why? Why are people so horrible? Teresita Bassa was born in the Philippines in 1929 and later immigrated to the U.S., where she completed a master's degree in music. By February 1977, Teresita was living by herself and working as a respiratory therapist in a hospital near Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> I guess music doesn't pay. <laughs> she was also taking up music again, working on a doctoral thesis at Loyola University. Apart from being really brainy at music, she was just a normal person getting on with life and giving out free piano lessons to local kids. She was not seemingly involved in any crime rings, dodgy dealings, or other nefarious things. Now, according to all who knew her, Teresita was a decent woman and not the type of person you would think would be involved in any sort of violent event. It is a felony. Unfortunately for Teresita Bassa, though, that was how she would meet her end. Yet yeah, plenty of people who are not involved in crime or murders or violence or anything like that meet their ends at the, as the victim of a crime. Because unfortunately, that's how crime works. You just need a perpetrator and a victim. The victim doesn't need to be also perpetrator as well. They don't. I mean, often they are. Because it's like, you know, especially like gangs and stuff. When there was a gang killing, it's generally not just some innocent person. It's usually, I don't know fellow gang member, some shit like that. Someone trying to, you know, re what's it called? Not nussle in? Bustle in? Crustle in? Nussle, nestle in? You know, when they get on on my turf. What? Why? I'm dumb today. On the evening of the 21st of February, 1977, Bassa got a phone call from a work friend during their chat. It came out that Bassa was expecting a man to drop around later that night, but she didn't give a name or a reason why he was going to be there. The phone call lasted about half an hour. It was about an hour after that that Bassa's neighbors smelled smoke and the building janitor called the fire department. When firefighters arrived, it became clear that the smoke was coming from Bassa's apartment. Inside the apartment, they found a burning mattress and underneath that, the naked body of Teresita Bassa underneath the mattress to make it perfectly clear that she'd been murdered there was a butcher's knife still embedded in her chest and her clothes were in a pile beside her jesus yeah we know she's murdered she's under a mattress that's been set on fire murder's probably it's not like she climbed onto the mattress and then somehow set it on fire above her what the f what you don't need that butcher's knife that is what we call overkill you have 
have said enough. While this initially looked like a sexually motivated attack, investigators later concluded that she hadn't been sexually assaulted. The perpetrator stabbed Vassa and then tried to cover up the crime by burning her apartment down. While she had been discovered before her body and the apartment were completely destroyed, no notable evidence was found apart from, amongst other bits and bobs, a note written by Vassa saying, Get theater tickets for AS. Who this AS was, police didn't have a clue and didn't really know if it was pertinent to the crime or not. With no real suspects and no leads, the case went nowhere for almost six months. Yeah, like, I have to say, like, my notes. If someone, like, if I was murdered and tucked underneath my mattress and it was set on fire and the police gave me there and were like, let's look at this to-do list, it would be a mess of weird shit because I use abbreviations all the time that won't make sense to anyone else. I'll use, like, shorthand. I'll just, because I'll add something to my to-do list and be like, window. And it will just be like, only I know what we're referring to here. And it might be like, I don't know, to fix a repaired window. I, I can't even think why I came up with the word window, but there's lots of different things that it could mean. Possession, nine tenths of the law. I have no idea what that means. I've heard that phrase so many times. Like, possession's nine tenths of the law, but I have no idea what it means. Hopefully, I'm going to find out. Finally, during the summer of 1977, a lead emerged from the case, and it wasn't the usual sort of tip the police were used to getting. Detective Joe Stahula, which maybe rhymes with Dracula. Okay, Stacula. I didn't look it up. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. It's like, it might be this. I'm just guessing. Well, just let me guess, Katie. I can guess. Stacula. Okay. He received a note asking him to get in touch with the Dr. Chua about the case. And I've seen the doctor's first name being given as Juan, Jose, and Joe, so let's play him safe and just call him Doctor. <laughs> yeah, that, easy. Like when you don't know someone's first name, Mr. So and so. <laughs> when Stacular and his partner eventually met up with the doc, he had a strange door story to sell. He said over the course of the summer, his wife, Rema Bias, also known as Remy. Rema Bias is a sick name. <laughs> Rema Bias. What's your name? Yeah, I'm Rema Bias. I like that. Had been possessed multiple times by the ghost of Teresita Bassa, and the Bassa had named the killer during these trances. What does Dr. Chua have to do with this? What's like his connection? Is he just a random dude? He just wrote a letter to the police? That's all? According to Dr. Chua, Remy, who was also from the Philippines, like Bassa, had been having dreams and visions about the murdered woman. One day, while he was with her, she had taken a nap and then suddenly started speaking to her in a voice that wasn't her own. She appeared to be in a trance-like state and asked the doctor directly for his help, begging him to go to the police as her killer was still at large. Chua said that his wife spoke in Tagalog, which is spoken in the Philippines with a Spanish accent that Bassa had. Why, why would she have a Spanish accent if she's from the Philippines? What's going on? Chua was understandably quite freaked out by this, especially after his wife snapped out of the trance and didn't recall anything having happened. He didn't do anything at first, as the whole thing just seemed a bit weird. I get the feeling that this Remy woman knows who the killer is, and she's like, how am I going to get word out about who the killer was without somehow implicating myself? And I think she's faking this trance-like thing to be able to tell people while also having a convenient excuse. Although any police officer is going to be like, it's not a trance. You just know and you're trying to tell us without saying that you know. Right? Right? Remy went into further trances over the next couple of weeks, though with the phantom voice identifying itself as Teresita Bassa. The ghost then went on to actually name her killer, saying that it was Alan Showery, someone who worked at the hospital. Hey, and this guy has the initials AS. Why didn't he pop up in a list of people the police might want to check out? Well, this point seems impossible to decode. Wait, because he's just a random dude who worked at the hospital. There's going to be tons of people with the initials AS. Alan Shepard. He was the, wasn't he the first American in space? <laughs> it's immediately custom right. Probably not him. <laughs> Moving on, the Chuas didn't bother the police with the paranormal visitations until eventually so much information was coming from Terra Sea to via the mouth of Remy that they decided they had new choi no choice. Channel through Remy. Bassa confirmed the following details of the case. Alan Shower, it was an acquaintance from work, and he was supposed to go to Bassa's apartment on the faithful night to help her fix a television. Instead of helping her, he assaulted her and stabbed her and hid her body under the mattress. Before lighting the mattress on fire to hide any evidence, he stole some jewelry from her room, which had originally been bought in France for Bassa's mother. Bassa gave a description of a few distinctive pieces and said Shari had then given some of this jewelry to his girlfriend. Bassa also gave Dr. Troyes the names of four people in her family who would be able to recognize and identify the pieces. When the Trois finally gave all of this information to Detective Stacula, he thought it was worth a sniff, especially as they actually gave him the name Alan Showery and the possibility of proving he had been in the apartment via the stolen jewelry. Can you imagine Alan Showery gets arrested? And they're like, 
why do you suspect it's me? And the detective's like, well, because, well, someone's telling us that it's you, but they're not really. <laughs> the police hadn't been able to ascertain if anything had been stolen from Bass's apartment, so here, possible possession aside, was a lead with something to back it up. Had Bass finally been able to steer the investigation towards her murderer? Finally. Thank you, girl. No, because she's dead, and it's just this woman knows some details about the crime we don't know how she's related or like what relationship she has with bassa but we know there's something going on because obviously ghost possession isn't real right we can all agree on that dead women tell true tales all right so a ghost has turned up and spoken through a fellow filipina giving some details on a crime and actually naming the killer if you're the police would you follow up on this lead seeing as how they had precious little to go on and that the initials of alan showery matched the previously unknown as on base's note stacular probably thought eh, what the hell and he and another detective called lee eplin decided to go do a little checking up on the showery character yeah of course they check up on it again i mean it's got to be super obvious to the police that this woman is not possessed, but she obviously knows details because she has been told, and she is using this as a front to get that information out there. Is this not blindingly obvious to anyone else? First off, they found that while he did work at the same hospital as Basra, he was in a different apartment, so maybe that's why they missed him before. Yeah, hospitals are big, and AS is not like some super uncommon initials. Asking around, they were surprised to find out that other colleagues had heard that he was supposed to be helping Va Bassa fix her TV on the day of the murder. Also, a background check turned up a couple of arrests for sexual assault and robbery, although no apparent convictions. All right, well, yeah, fair enough. Now this guy has moved into suspect number f one because there seems to be there's a tip off from a woman. He's got this past record. He was supposed to be there on the evening. So far, this guy's looking pretty goddamn guilty. Yeah, I do feel a little guilty. And of course they missed him the first time because they wouldn't check everyone at the hospital where she works or everyone she f knows who has the initials AS. And that could also just be the name of a play. Who knows? Also, a background check turns up a couple of arrests for sexual assault. Oh, I read that already. He was home with his girlfriend, who detectives noticed was wearing a ring that seemed to match a description that they had received from the ghost of Teresita Bassa. While Showery initially denied having ever been to Bassa's apartment, he was happy to go to the police station for a proper interview. Well, he probably wasn't happy about it, but he went of his own accord is what I mean. While at the police station, the detectives mentioned that they knew about the whole TV fixing thing, and Showery eventually admitted that he had indeed been to Baz's apartment on the night of the murder, but that he hadn't been able to fix the TV there, and then had just left. It's since. He said he'd gone straight back home because his girlfriend, Yanka Kumluk, had been having issues with the electricity in their apartment, and he needed to go and sort that out. The detectives quickly nipped back for a chat with Kumluk, who immediately threw Shaori under the bus by basically going, eh, what electrical problems? Alan fixed anything electrical? You've got to be kidding me. Uh-oh, busted. <laughs> Get your alibi sorted. Look, look, look. If, it's a, if it's an alibi that can easily be disproven or tested within moments, don't even give it a shot. Why would you try? It just makes you look like a liar because you're a liar. Getting easily called out. Taking another lead from the dead bass's information, the detectives asked Kumluk about any new jewelry Shaori might have given her, and she confirmed that in February the murder was committed. He had given her a few new things, supposedly as a late Christmas present. Pressing the ghost tip off even further, Stacular and Eplin contacted some of the people mentioned during Remy's trance, and they confirmed that these new pieces of jewelry did indeed belong to the Bass family. The buildup of evidence finally led to Shaori cracking and confessing to the murder of Teresita Bassa. Apparently, Bassa had been generous with money in the past, tipping him helping out with errands and stuff as she knew he was having financial troubles. Chowry said that he had intended to rob her as he was low on rent money, but after the murder, which he admitted to staging to look like sexual assault, he only found $30. He then took the jewelry to and set the place on fire. Finally, it seemed that the ghost of the victim had got her man. And by ghost of the victim, we definitely mean the woman who knows her and is channeling this information through a fake ghost character. I mean, obviously, Jesus. The trial. News that it was the victim herself who had identified Shaori led to sensational news headlines when the trial came around in January 1979, such as, Voice from Grave Names Murderer Begs Vengeance. 
from the Boston Globe. Woman in trance, nails killer from the Chronicle Telegram, and did voice from the grave finger murder suspect. A slightly saucy headline from the Chicago Tribune. While the evidence seemed quite strong and Shari had confessed, he then changed his plea to not guilty, saying police had threatened him. His lawyer, William Swano, called out Remy Chua's trances as fake and said there was no real probable cause to have gone after Shari in the first place. According to the Washington Post's article, headlined Voice from the Grave Evokes a Murder Trial, Swano is quoted as saying, Never to my knowledge has a man been arrested because of a supernatural vision. Police have never before been informed of a criminal's name by a voice from the grave. Holy sh**. Uh, am, I, am I insane? Here? Yeah? This is obviously so completely transparent. It seems that the jury was also not convinced that Bassa really did speak through Remy Chua as they deadlocked and a mistrial was declared. Don't worry though, Shari actually did end up pleading guilty again a couple of weeks later and was sentenced to 14 years for the murder and a concurrent sentence for robbery and arson. And then somehow is paroled after serving only four years, which doesn't really seem right. What the f***? Murdered someone, hid them under a mattress and set them on fire! Four years! America! This is America! Land of the free! We had to imprison people for ages! Four years is not right. Come on, America! You could do better! So there you go, the case of the mysterious voice from the grave, uh, which hopefully put the right person in jail, even if it was for a pathetically short amount of time. <laughs> what? Four years?! The f what do we make of it? Hmm. Was Remy Chua really possessed by the ghost of Ter Teresita Bassa? And if she wasn't, how did she know all the details that led to Shari's undoing? Let's dig in in a bit more detail. A bit more detail. Who was Remy Chua? Yes, she also came from the Philippines like Bassa, and they did know each other a little. Boom! Chua had worked in the same hospital as Bassa, and therefore in the same hospital as Shari. She had been fired, however, around the time of the murder, although I couldn't find out exactly when. Presumably, with a personal connection and shared background with Bassa, Remy Chua was affected deeply when she was murdered. Could this have made her a willing and effective vessel for the restless spirit of Bassa, who was probably getting a little cheesed off that the initials of her killer were literally in police hands, but nothing was happening in her case? Oh, chill out. It's not that bad. It's a to-do list which says, get theatre tickets for eight AS, not AS murdered me and hid me under the bed with a knife in my chest and then set my bed on fire. What are you talking about? Just imagine it. You're Teresita Bassa and you've just been brutally murdered. Your soul is floating about in the ether, making sure your killer is brought to justice. Okay, you think? There's a phone call I had saying that a man was coming round. I didn't give a name, but the police are looking for people I knew with the initials AS in that handy note I wrote myself. That should quickly lead them to Alan Showery and other people know that he was coming round to fix my TV, so at the very least he'll be on the suspect list so I don't, so I can go to my soul's final resting place, wherever that may be. Hang on, this is taking a bit longer than I thought. Come on, guys. Hey, this is Alan Shari. Look into him. His previous arrest for burglary and sexual assault. Guys? Guys? I mean, yeah, I, okay, I get it. There is... I don't blame the police too much for not tying this together. I really don't. I, I mean, I don't think I would have tied it together. And I'm a genius. Look, this is getting ridiculous. I'll just have to waft my soul into my old pal Remy and get her to give the details of the cops. That'll be believable. Right? <laughs> yeah, because souls, ethers, and ghosts and ghouls are totally real. Ah! We only have the word of Remy and Dr. Chua about these trances, as they didn't happen in front of anyone else. Remy would apparently be totally unaware of what she had said and done after the messages were delivered, and they weren't given in those frustratingly vague messages that suppose mediums or whatever get from the great beyond. I'll let Simon go off on a rant here, as I suspect he'll come up with something more entertaining than I can think of at the moment. Bonus points if he does it in his Southern Preacher voice. All right, then, let's see what I can go up with. No pressure. No pressure. Yeah. Those, I imagine the police from down south. There we go. Be like, yo, clean us. <laughs> clean us. We haven't got any leads on this case. <laughs> Bring in Martha. Get her out of that weird house she lives in in the forest. Get her down here. You're gonna clean us? <laughs> Something like that. You're welcome. That wasn't, you know, I don't like the pressure. I don't like, I'm not good under pressure. It's not even funny. <laughs> just vaguely racist. Anyway, the messages coming from Chua explicitly stated that it was Teresita Bassa talking. Chua's voice and even her accent changed. Bassa gave details that presumably Chua could have no way of knowing, such as the stolen jewelry and who to contact to confirm who it belonged to. She outright named Chowry and begged Dr. Chua to take the information to the police. How could Chua have known all this stuff? Was he really possessed by the ghosts of her murdered friends?
This isn't the only time this sort of possession has happened, but it's definitely different from what would be considered demonic possession. I was looking up some general stats for exorcisms in the United States, and alarmingly, according to the New York Post, the New York Post is like a, a tabloid though, right? It's, you know, it's like the sun or some shit that, you know, I'd be used to. Uh, Monsignor Stephen Rossetti and his team in Washington, D.C. are currently ousting demons at a rate of up to 20 per week. <laughs> Remy Chois, that's a good grift you got going there, guys. Remy Chois wasn't harmed and didn't do any levitating or puking during her trance state. And if we had to believe that it was Basis Ghost telling the story, it seems that she literally just used her as a vessel to get herself heard. Some people just leave the story there, accepting that a strange and supernatural force was behind the case. Yeah, yeah. Lazy people. That's not enough for us. It, I hope there's not YouTube videos out there who just end on that. I know there are because I'm sure like if this channel was actually like, oh my God, supernatural's real. All of these people, they were possessed by ghosts. It's like this channel would be a lot more popular because, you know, dumb people love that shit. And instead, here it is, and it's kind of like skeptical and all of that stuff. So it's like, but, and, and real. And it's, you know, it is what it is. But I couldn't do, I couldn't do the opposite because I uh, have something we like to call moral character. Ah! <laughs> and I'm totally happy to throw shade at all that nonsense on YouTube because I think it's worse than this. <laughs> and yes, uh, at this point, if you're listening to this as a uh, podcast rather than on YouTube, yes, I am tilting my head back and looking down my nose. You're very welcome. While we cannot be 100% sure that these possessions weren't real, yes, we can, Katie, because possessions are not real ever, Katie. Sh <laughs> Or maybe just me, at least. I'm sure Simon has said ghosts aren't real at least a few times so far. There are definitely a few things that we can throw up as rational defense. Yes, let's go. Ghostbusters. When researching stuff like this story, I tend to be totally credible and just believe everything I read. Do you mean credible or gullible, Katie? I'm confused. Then I read in a post. <laughs> Guys, I sound like such a dick, but I really, I really have so little patience for this nonsense. I feel it's just a grift, it's a scam, it's a con from the, the, the church exercising demons, which I'm sure they're getting money for, allegedly, to, uh, you know, mediums pretending that they can communicate with people's dead relatives, to my f***ing mother-in-law got conned into doing some, like, automatic writing, where it's like, you know, someone thinks that they can teach you how to write, and you close your eyes and you enter a trance-like state and you write from, like, your dead mother and all this stuff, and I'm like, you just... Your money is getting ripped off. And now they're, they're, their dog has, like, testicular cancer, and they couldn't get an appointment for the, 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 the cancer to be removed. All the, like, the tumor. They don't even know what it is yet, and his balls to be removed. She's like, well, I bought this anti-cancer music off the internet, and I'm like, oh, God but they're just exploiting you. And I don't blame her. It's this industry. It's full of scams. And I hate these people. And they know it's not real. Uh, no, not really. They know it's, I have another family member who kind of does this and it's appalling. As previously mentioned, Bassa, Shaori, and Chua all worked in the same hospital at some point. Chua's husband proclaimed that while that was the case, Remy Chua never actually met Bassa or Shaori. I'm pretty sure the doc is mistaken on this point, though, as I read in more than one piece that Chua believed Shaori had complained about her, and then this led to her being fired. Yeah, um, <laughs> you listen to the guy who has sexual assault allegations against him and you know, Jesus. Why is he even working in a hospital? That seems like there are vulnerable people around and he's a weirdo. Let's not do that. That seems weird. Also, this is probably, in my opinion, just set up. I love it. When a plan comes together. So Dr. Chua is like, no, 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 they didn't know each other. So the, the demonic possession thing is more believable because obviously there's a reason that she doesn't want to have her finger pointed at. Maybe because the other, she got, the other guy got the other, the guy, the bad guy got the other woman fired. So she doesn't want to directly point the finger at him. Whatever. This must have happened not long after Bassa was killed as Chua had her first, wait, what happens? Oh, we're getting fired as Chua had her first vision about her after learning that she'd just been given the boot. It was also alleged that Shaori was harassing Chua and she believed that he had prank called her on the day before her first vision. What is he, 12? Coincidence? 
well, obviously, at first, it just seems to be a coincidence. Well, this does seem to be suspicious timing. You believe a certain person at work has got you fired, and the next day you're having visions and naming him as a murder suspect. Oh, okay, that could be a different angle. She's just like, F this guy. I think it's him, and I'm going to use this demonic possession to point a finger at him. F yeah. And then the police actually looked into it, and it was him. Yes. All much more believable than ghosts. Hmm, well, this is the strongest anti-possession theory we really have. Chua, whether consciously or subconsciously, was channeling Bassa and outing Showery as the killer. Uh, consciously, not subconsciously. <laughs> And it seems to be a fact that these trance states actually happened. While they were not witnessed by anyone other than her husband, the trial's version of events has never changed, even after Shari was eventually jailed. Was Trois faking the whole thing, or was she using this as an excuse to be able to pass important information on with some buffer between herself and Shari? Bing, 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 bing! That's the badger! Great balls of tinsel, you can be annoying sometimes. She was probably afraid of him, and this might have been some combination of revenge for herself and genuine belief that he was the killer. Remember that it seemed to be common knowledge Knowledge that Shari had been going to see Bassa to fix her TV on the night of the murder. If Bassa had known he was in tight financial straits, it's likely that other people did too. He would have been a person of interest in the workplace at least. Who knows? Maybe he even told someone or alluded to it, or even bragged about it and Chua overheard. Maybe he told her direct to her face, but thought she'd be too scared to tell anyone else. So these trances might actually have been Chua's subconscious at play, creating a safe space for her to get the information out to her husband but being able to hide it in her real life. Well, there's no, he's got a dark secret hiding behind him eyes. Exactly. There we go. This seems quite a likely explanation for how Shari was eventually found, but what about the other things like the jewelry? She was told. The police had no idea anything had been taken until Bass's ghost pointed it out. Oh, okay, I see. Sorry, no, I see why this could be a problem. Um, it's total, There's definitely reasonable explanations, though. She could have said, I think it's likely he's going to steal from me. He's coming round. Uh, something like this. Something like this. I don't know. They know he's in financial straits. She should, it just seems like it's it's not impossible to put together. That's what I'm saying. Well, here, again, we can maybe work that out. Maybe Shaori had told people about his crime or mentioned that he had given his, girl, given his girlfriend some new bling and Char put two and two together. Exactly. If you're going to be committing murder for $30, it's unlikely that you'd be splashing out on unnecessary gifts at the same time. Or maybe Chua even saw the jewels in real life on Kumluk and recognized them as belonging to Bassa. I'm really grasping at straws here, though, as there doesn't seem to be that much tying Chua to the amount of knowledge that she had of the case. How could she have known the names and numbers of Bass's relatives. I suppose it's possible that in the months following the murder, she might have looked them up or got in touch with them to offer her condolences, so maybe she did have prior knowledge, but again, that's just me spitballing. Shari almost got away with the whole thing too, ironically, because of this voice from the grave. Police hadn't figured out his involvement prior to the messages from beyond, and when he was eventually called in, he confessed due to the evidence found, not because a ghost had called him out. During his first trial, the trials were actually called as witnesses for the defense, the idea being that the whole ghost possession thing was so outlandish that no weight should be given to it, and therefore the police had conducted their whole investigation into Shari without probable cause. The probable cause is enough. Isn't it enough to be like, yeah, it was, we know it's not ghosts, obviously, but she's trying to give us a message while having that buffer, as Katie Well describes it, between, between her and Showery. Can't the police just say that? That feels like it's definitely enough. You don't need much. Plus the note with the AS. They work at the same hospital. He's already got some sexual assault convictions. Mission accomplished. Boom! Let's go! It was only later that he decided to once again plead guilty, funnily enough, right around the second anniversary of Teresita Bass's death, so maybe he got a visit from the spirit world too, convincing him to finally admit to what he did. Or maybe he did it to just get a more lenient sentence, which worked because he walked after four years. I'm still mad about that, which is just mental. I can't believe that. That's the craziest part of today's story, that he only was in prison for four years. For murder! Full on murder. And he must add he had a record. Fing hell. Let's stay on the skeptical side of things a bit longer. What might have made the Trois concoct or at least stick to this story in the first place? Was there more than merely justice for Teresa Basser at stake? Maybe. Not long after the second trial, a book was written by Carol Mercado called A Voice from the Grave, the shocking true crime solved through psychic phenomena. 
Oh, please. It's just money spinning, allegedly. She was a friend of the Trois and wanted to get their side of the story out. Unsolved Mysteries, that bastion of good reporting, aired an episode featuring the case in 1990 and 1992. Reporters John O'Brien and Edward Bauman published another book called Terror Sea to the Voice from the Grave, the incredible but true story of how an occult vision solved the murder of Terra Sita Bassa. Oh my god, the money spinning. This is so... Ah, at least this isn't really hurting anyone. Um, but still, it's just kind of isn't it? In 1996, a dramatized version of the story came out as a TV movie called Guess What? Crimes of Passion, Voice from the Grave. Currently with an IMDb mate rating of 5.4, I won't be adding it to my watch list anytime soon. Plus, how can it really improve on the original story? Anyway, my point was that maybe the trials got financial benefits from some of these allegedly the first book oh definitely i'm not really sure if they would earn anything from any of the other stuff do we know that definitely i'm just gonna say maybe um <laughs> because you don't want to imply that jeez according to a book called sinister chicago by callie joy kramer the Trois didn't like the publicity that came with the case and kept low profiles after showery was sentenced this maybe points away from them wanting to make some supernatural moolah but at this point we cannot say for sure ghostly wrap up all right so do we think remy Chua was a Faking the trances and passing on information she had overheard or strongly suspected. B. Actually going into some trance-like state due to fear and stress and passing on information subconsciously. C. Never going into any trances and the trials just made that bit up so they could blame the ghost if any of the details ended up being wrong. Or D. Really possessed by a fellow countrywoman who was trying to get vengeance on her murderer. It's A. It's A. Possibly C. But it's A. <laughs> While it doesn't necessarily tie everything up in a neat little bundle, I personally think that the most likely answer is B. <laughs> Katie, no! Come on! I know this one doesn't mean it's supernatural or anything, but... No, 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 no. This is not... No, 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 no. No. No! Ah, okay, so reminder, B was actually going into some trance-like state due to fear and stress and passing on the information subconsciously. I just don't think that's that, that's likely. I don't think people pass on information subconsciously very often. <laughs> With knowledge that Chua had weighing on her so heavily that it came out in a weird way, Detective Stacular himself wasn't quite sure about what to think about it. He's quoted as saying, To this day, I'm not quite sure whether I believe how the information was obtained. Nonetheless, everything is completely true. So the prevailing view seems to be that it doesn't really matter how the information came out. What's important is that it did eventually come out. Yes, agreed. <laughs> Leading to the right man being caught and Teresita Bazza's killer finally being brought to justice. Yes, Totally agree, I don't care it came out. Even if it was a ghost, it wasn't. But even if it was, the right guy's in prison. And no, he was, he's not even in prison. He only went to prison for four years. That's where this episode ends. Thank you for being here.